But Larry Bell, I'm even happier that Professor Larry Bell is here. Uh, and, and that, of course, is why Cameron was playing that, not because he's a big fan of disco, although he is. Uh, Professor Bell, thank you so much for joining us on the program tonight, sir. Great talking to you. Well, hi, Cam. I'm glad to be on again. Uh, a real pleasure. And I got to tell you, I loved your column in uh, Forbes. I think it, it should be required reading for every gun owner between now and Election Day. Now, listen, I, and I know that my audience uh, has probably already read it, but Take this to your range. Take it to your gun store. You know, pass it around. Do the email forwards. Make sure that every gun owner you know uh, has the opportunity to read this. Six big reasons why gun owners should vote like their rights are at stake. And, and you know, again, Larry, uh, the rights are at stake. Well, I think a lot of rights are at stake, not just guns. But I think guns are symbolic of a lot of things that are at risk right now. Yeah, so let's go through the uh, the six big reasons you uh, you give. You say... Uh, there is an ideological disdain for gun rights uh, within this administration, and that's not changing. Well, I don't think anybody doubts that. Um, I don't think, you know, they, you know, they've changed their stripes a whole lot. I don't think there's any evidence of that. Uh, of course, there are a lot of hunters in Pennsylvania and some swing states that uh, they probably don't want to antagonize right now. But as I mentioned in the sixth point, uh, you know, no more Mr. Nice Guy. You know, when you when we come uh, past this election, uh, God help us all. Well, yeah, and, you know, you go through the list uh, from 94 until 2002. He served on the board of the Joyce Foundation, which contributed more than $18 million between uh, 98 and 2001 uh, to anti-Second Amendment groups. Uh, he banned the reimportation and sale of uh, nearly a million M1 Garands and uh, carbines from South Korea. The uh, ATF was uh, trying to go after uh, 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 shotguns imported from uh, overseas. You talk about Vice President Biden's uh, support for gun control, the fact that the Obama campaign uh, uh, itself uh, it notes the president's support for a semi-auto ban. Attorney General Holder has reiterated the administration's support for a uh, ban on semi-automatic firearms. You know, it, th this, this, this support for gun control, Professor, uh, is real, it's genuine, and the president has held these ideas for a long, long time. And then you got Hillary Clinton on top of that and some other appointments, so uh, it's, not a, it's not a pretty picture. We don't have a lot of gun advocacy there, or, gun, or I wouldn't think even any, any rights advocacy as far as the Constitution is concerned. Yeah, well, I, I mean, you, you look at, uh, it doesn't seem that the administration staunch defenders of the First Amendment either. Um, now, uh, reason number two, uh, Fast and Furious. Uh, and, and the Fast and Furious investigation we've talked about uh, so much, the Inspector General's report that came out that uh, uh, still left so many questions unanswered, and the Inspector General himself said there were avenues that uh, he wanted to pursue that uh, he could not pursue because the administration basically was not cooperative. Yeah, and, of course, that's, you know, that's a, that's a broad-cutting issue with, you know, with, with the... Uh, uh, with Holder that uh, on many fronts when it comes to, uh, you know, election, obstruction of elections and, and everything else, uh, it's, uh, I think it's, it's symbolic of the, you know, constitu constitutional obstructionism we're seeing in the Justice Department. And it's, again, that's, that's pretty frightening. Well, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, the uh, Univision special that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, pointed out new crimes that had not previously been associated with Fast and Furious and pointed out as well, Professor, uh, that there were other operations going on while Fast and Furious was going on that weren't being run out of the Phoenix uh, field office. That, that, you know, this is the entire argument for the Obama administration is that this was just something that happened locally, uh, not a big deal, certainly nothing that the administration really had anything to do with. Uh, Univision completely undercut that argument by pointing out things like uh, 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 Operation Castaway uh, and other projects where guns were walked uh, concurrently with the Fast and Furious operation, but in, in, in other locales, in places like your home state of Texas. I think, you know, a lot of your readers and a lot of us that uh, have even been marginally following the, you know, the issues more broadly in the, in the political uh, arena are aware of a lot of these things that I mentioned in the article, but it's it's just like when you when you print things in ILA and so on, and I write things, and you start connecting them together, and you just show them, you know, you, you show them where there can't be any coincidences. I mean, these these are all self-reinforcing sorts of issues, and mm -hmm. say, oh yeah, I remember that, and oh yeah, that's true, and oh oh yeah, and then when you when you pull them all together, you know, 
that's when it's uh, that's when it gets pretty alarming. Uh, we we tend to have a short attention span, and we tend to things you know news gets kind of shut out and forgotten. But yeah, no, you're right. I mean, that's that's one of the the troubles I, I think just with uh, you know it's the double edged sword. We can we can get information from a lot of sources, but that means we're getting a lot of information, a deluge. Uh, and and you're right. Sometimes you forget just all of the details in the the uh, the timeline of everything. Um, now the third item that you mentioned, the, the anti-gun appointments going uh, around Congress. Um, and, and you say that the uh, there was a Houston gun store owner uh, who talked to you and said that uh, a, a U.S. president could exert strong gun control influence just by uh, new dictates and new regulations to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Yeah, because, you know, these all these firearms dealers, you know, they have, you know, basically audits or checks periodically and whether it's quarterly or whatever i'm not really sure the timing i suspect it varies but but there's always new directives and 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 uh they're they're coming down and then if if vtfe finds that uh you're you know there's some kind of willful disregard for each you know for their various directives mm -hmm. uh, if there's too many of them or if they're you know some of they regard as serious then of course they can they can regulate right out of business and uh I, th I think a lot of gun shop uh, owners are particularly fearful of that, and so there's lots of ways to uh, to put pressure on, you know, on FFLs and gun sh gun shop owners that are again sort of under the radar. People, you know, general public isn't aware of it. Uh, no, I, I think you're absolutely right, and you know, we've already seen the administration uh, do one end run around Congress by requiring FFLs in Texas, in New Mexico, in Arizona, and California. Uh, to report the multiple sales of long guns, right? Uh, and, and they did this again without any uh, legislation, even though the uh, reporting requirement for multiple sales of handguns came about uh, as a result of the Gun Control Act of 1968, which, which was legislation. So, I mean, this administration really has shown a, a desire and a willingness uh, to to work outside of the uh, the legislative branch. In fact, you know they've got a they had a, a campaign slogan that they tried out for a while. Uh, we can't wait for Congress to act. Well, clearly they have the means to do it. And the question is, you know, I think if probably uh, they again they they don't want uh, their actions to be very visible right now before the election. But but I think the main point of the article is that we ain't seen nothing yet. You know, the fact that there was. A lot of angst about in 2008, prior to the election, that you know the, you know the end of the world was coming for gun owners, and and a lot of things that were expected or feared didn't materialize. And I'm basically saying don't, you know, don't get complacent because you know it's it's a whole different ball game now. This is just like when uh, when Obama was talking to the president of Russia and he thought the mic was off, you know, and he's saying mm -hmm. you know after you know after the election uh, I'll have more flexibility. And uh, oh yeah, okay, I'll, I'll pass this on to Vladimir. You know, uh, that's that's the kind of stuff that's really, I think, very very scary. Is what's what's going to happen this time? I think it's a new ball game. Well, I think you're right. Uh, and one thing we know as well that uh, will likely be a new ball game uh, in the next four years, and that's going to be uh, the Supreme Court. We're uh -huh. likely to see a number of retirements on the court, and that means that the whoever's in the White House. Uh, is going to have the opportunity to shape the direction of this court, not for the next four years, but for for decades to come. But we're having some. We've had some close decisions. Five court yeah. decisions. It doesn't take a whole lot to unbalance that right now. Well, no, absolutely not. And and you look at who uh, Barack Obama has nominated. Uh, you know, Elena Kagan, Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, you point out Elena Kagan. Uh, you know, helped participate in 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 uh, writing that uh, ninety eight White House executive order that. Uh, ban the imports of uh, semi-automatic rifles. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's still, you know, uh, ILA and the NRA doing good, good job of trying to correct a lot of mythology. But this whole notion of semi-automatic and assault weapons, you know, this, these, these terms, these pejorative terms, and you know, and I, I would guess that 95 percent of the you know, people in the media have no clue what a semi-automatic weapon is. And it's, and I, I I still have no clue what an assault weapon is. You know, I think you can assault people with a with a baseball bat. You know, it's you know they they adopt these terms that sound like they they sound sophisticated and they sound like they know what they're talking about. But but fundamentally, there's just so much rampant inf misinformation. And you know, I think a lot of public think you can go out and buy a, a, a including 
you know, people should know a lot better, like O'Reilly, they they think you can go out and buy, you know, a machine gun. And uh, and I just think there's there's so much uh, so much of that in the media that uh, really colors the public view of, of uh, you know, they're, they're given they're given the notion that the, the laws are very uh, flexible, where in fact they are not at all. Absolutely. Talking with uh, Larry Bell, a uh, Forbes.com contributor and a professor uh, in uh, Houston, Texas, uh, about the uh, six big reasons why gun owners uh, need to vote like the rights depend on in this election uh, season. Uh, you say uh, the fifth reason, Larry, uh, gun control expansion under the radar, stealthy strategies. Talking about that uh, quote from Sarah Brady, who said that the president's told her uh, we're working on gun control, but we, we got to do it under the radar. Well, we still got that small arms treaty hanging out there, and yeah. I think again they're not too anxious to have that come come to the fore before you know before the election. People say, well, it's going to take a you know a big majority in the Senate, and it's, it'll never be approved. But there's there's other ways of doing that, and I think uh, you know the the fact that uh, Bolton uh, Ambassador, former uh, John Bolton, former ambassador, warned that you know it's it's a backdoor kind of Trojan horse way of of saying let's let's you know let's go along with the United Nations sort of thing, and uh, my concern is is that it's a precedent for doing something like Agenda 21, where where it's introduced as soft law, and and uh, the mechanism is in place, and now we're seeing all this you know, Agenda uh, 21 mm -hmm. uh, sustainable development kind of stuff happening, which uh, is just nothing more than you know the United Nations exerting influence over. You know, central planning in in the United States, and 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 these are dangerous precedents. Well, yeah, and and it, you know, in a way, it goes back to uh, the Supreme Court nominees because you know there there is a a mindset among uh, folks like Justice Ginsburg who who believe that uh, we need to be given uh, more credence to international law, less respect for our own U.S. Constitution, and so let's say a small arms treaty uh, were to be signed. Uh, even if it were uh, not to be ratified by the Senate, uh, uh, Professor, you know, look, there are some judges out there that would say the decision to sign this treaty indicates uh, an obligation on the part of the United States in some regard to blah, 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 blah. And, and, and you know, the idea of uh, the Constitution actually having more weight than this treaty would, would just sort of be shunted aside. And I think a lot of judges, and even some fairly decent ones, are intimidated. They're afraid, you know, they don't want to be reversed. And they're taking fairly cautious views of, of interpretations of the Second Amendment, and and uh, you know I think that I think I think the you know the Second Amendment is is in peril. I really I really do. It can be, you know, it can be defanged to the point that uh, we don't recognize it anymore. Uh, yeah, no. Listen, I, I agree with you, Larry. Uh, and, and you know, I think we're in a really good place when it comes to our right to keep and bear arms. Uh, at the moment because of the hard work that gun owners have done over decades. But when you've got uh, individuals who are so hell-bent on uh, achieving their agenda and they've been thwarted legislatively, uh, you know, they, they've uh, uh, lost at the uh, Supreme Court in Heller and McDonald, you know, it's not like the gun control advocates have gone away. And they, that was close. That was five to four. Ab yeah. Absolutely it was. And, and you know, we, we saw the, the four-judge minority. Not only was it close, we saw the four-judge minority clearly want to uh, uh, relitigate these issues and, and basically say that Heller was wrongly decided. Yeah, yeah. So the final thing, you say a nothing-to-lose future agenda. No more Mr. Nice Guy. In other words, what does he have to worry about in the second term? Right. Well, I think uh, Obama. And maybe I'm maybe I'm a little little hard on the on the little guy, <laughs> but but I, I tend to believe he's all about Obama, and and I don't think he cares much about anything else. I think once he gets reelected, he's he's done his thing. He's going to establish his transformational you know image and push through anything he can. And uh, it's remarkable when you disregard the Constitution how much you can accomplish, particularly if you have a uh, a lame Congress that'll go along with things, just like they have with the EPA. You know, the EP Congress Congress has the ability to, you know, to clamp down and and to assert itself, but it it's shown no inclination to do so. And uh, so, it's not just the presidency that's the issue; it's it's what happens in the Senate, particularly as well.
Yeah, absolutely. Larry, thank you again, sir, for coming on the program. A real pleasure as always, and uh, I look forward to talking again very soon. Keep up the good fight, Cam. You too, sir. Uh, professor Larry Bell joining us uh, from Forbes.com, also a, a professor at the University of Houston.